This is The Good Government Show. When it comes down to it, libraries are very versatile. And we've changed over the years so much, and I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, because people say, we don't need libraries anymore because we don't read, you know, people don't read, people don't. It's, you know, it's so much more than that. And I think if people who have that attitude would come to a library, they would be super surprised at what we have. There are some libraries who will have showers. You know, they'll partner with a company that, that does that and come on site, offer showers to individuals. Actually, the day that we plan to launch our cell phone service, we're actually planning to have shower services available for that event. Showers in libraries, oh, we have come a long way. You know, it was back in the 1700s when public libraries were first established in the United States. When libraries first opened, it was about knowledge, books, magazines, newspapers. It was a place to read, period. Welcome to The Good Government Show. I'm Carol Dioria. And I'm Dave Martin. And on this episode, we're going to talk a lot about libraries. But first, welcome to The Good Government Show. If you like us, tell your friends to listen too. Make sure to follow us and please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And please rate us where you listen to us. It will help bring us more stories of good government in action like this one. Yes. Today, it's all about modern libraries and the changing roles that libraries play. You know, back in the early days, libraries were funded by sometimes a local philanthropist, uh, maybe a Rockefeller type. But as towns and cities started to see the value of having a public that could read, well, they really embraced libraries. And one of the first large public libraries was the Boston Public Library, And that opened in 1854. Okay, well, there are still libraries, but like everything else, modern world, kind of big changes. So are libraries still relevant? I mean, what's up with libraries today? Well, you know, there are some mundane problems like library buildings that are so old, they don't even have enough electric outlets to charge people's cell phones and laptops. There are some heavy duty concerns like the censorship of books. Well, you know, funny you say that because, you know, I've been reading articles about librarians. Librarians are coming under fire. Um, You know, librarians are being threatened. Uh, They're being harassed on social media. They're calling for book bannings. I mean, they're trying to take out books like Huck Finn and, you know, other books that talk about, I guess, alternative or, or alternate lifestyles. You know, libraries are coming under fire. And that is a whole show in and of itself that we could spend a lot of time talking about. Yes, we probably could. Right. But then there are problems that people bring to the libraries because they really need help. So libraries are really changing. And that's the focus of Libraries Now, our podcast, how libraries are more than just books and some videos. Right. And libraries are still relevant. Oh, absolutely. But with our ability to download books, I would think that, you know, people probably just don't go to the library that much. Well, you know, and that's where we should begin, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kelvin Watson is the director of the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. And he says it right there. You don't have to physically go to the library anymore. Believe it or not, you can do it on a public bus. Or maybe sitting in a casino. Could you sit in a casino (laughs) and check out a book? Yeah, listen to it. Because you're at the table, you're losing. (laughs) And you're like, I got to get a book on how to win. So that that would be a good example. Only you would think of that. Well, you know, I like to read. Anyway. So So what did he say? Okay, so here's what he says about the public bus. Say you're on the bus and you go into your doctor's office or you go into a shopping mall, but it's downtime. You're just sitting there. But reach the library. Or like when you can't get a seat at the table because the $20 table's full. That's right. All right, go ahead. So you go sit on the bus. Right. And you can reach the library, believe it or not, right from the seat on the bus. Or the casino. Or the casino. Here's Kelvin Watson. We have 400 buses that we're able to provide digital library services to the community uh, via a QR code. And if you're also a visitor, we uh, provide you an opportunity for 14 days of access to our digital resources here. Uh, We have a bus that's wrapped. as well, like the library. So it looks like a library, uh, but it's actually a, a bus. Um, and we also are advertising and promoting the library at 50 of our uh, bus stops near our urban libraries in the in the community. We have 25 physical locations. So essentially, you know, the idea is to expand the library and promote the library beyond the physical walls so that you don't have to come into the library physically if you don't want to. You can now access the digital resources 
practically from anywhere. Would you believe they have 8,000 new library card holders because of those buses? And it gets even better. If you need a shower, their library can help you out with that too. There are some libraries doing uh, who, will, who will have showers um, come, you know, they'll partner with, with a company that, provide, that does that and come on site um, to offer showers to, to individuals. Actually, the, the day that we plan to launch our cell phone service, we're actually planning to have shower services available for that, for that, e, uh, we'll call it for that event, for that launch of the event, uh, as we, um, you know, as we move forward. So, yeah, so libraries do that as, as well. Provide showers, uh, feet meals to, um, to people, uh, you know, especially children, um, during the summer, for example, when there's no school, uh, you know, necessarily in session, that we're able to offer meals to, to, to students. Well, Carol, it sounds like what he's describing is more like a community center, really, than a library. Exactly. Over the years, libraries have offered workshops and guest speakers. Well, you know, I remember back to story time. I mean, I loved it when my mom dropped me off for story time at the library. I got to hear a good story. I got to see my friends and I got to check out any book I wanted. Mm, me too. I kept my library card. I was so proud of that thing. I had it in my purse and I was, it was just. Well, sure. You know, it's when you're six, that's your driver's license, <laughs> it was right? Like a, it's like a I coming got, of age. Look at me. I have my own library. I don't need you. I have my own library card. But the libraries have clearly moved beyond story time. So let me tell you about a place I found out about in Richland County, South Carolina, and their library program. What's happening in Richland? Well, in part, one of the things they've done is they've turned their library into space for a speakers bureau. And they created a program called Let's Talk Race. And the idea was to use local authors, bring them into the library, and speak on different issues on social justice and, you know, whatever else comes oh, up in that conversation. Must, that must spark an awful lot of conversation. It does. So much so they expanded their program. In fact, they had a recent program. They had a speaker who was affected by the church shooting in South Carolina. And he talked about gun violence really from a personal perspective. And they also had a, a discussion where they talked directly to teens about gun violence. So you know, lots gun, of conversation. It's amazing. Guns in libraries. It's just not what you expect at a library. No. And that's exactly the point. It's just a way that libraries are changing. It's another way they're expanding and changing in their community. Um, in Richland, they hold art classes. They teach things like needlepoint or scrapbooking. And they also have a movie club where they gather to watch movies and critique movies. That's the movie club. But they also just, you know, show movies, too. International residents, they can go to the library and they can take a class in learning how to speak English. And they also have a session where you can go to the library, sit down and talk to a lawyer and get free legal advice. <laughs> that is so much more than story time. Well, but they still have story time, too. And all in Richland, there are 13 branches and they're all doing innovative things. You can talk to a library social worker. They can connect you to the folks and get you the right services. And they even put out a magazine. In fact, a recent issue had an article about how to have a productive family dinner conversation. So everybody's not interrupting and exactly. chatting. Exactly. Like in those loud Italian families where they all just point and yell <laughs> they, and scream. They do that. Right. Oh, yeah. We'll see. Your, fa your family definitely needs to read this so exactly. they can all like all right. participate, okay. Okay. participate in a meaningful way with, you know, no challenges. Yes. But, but you know what? I want to talk about that story time just for one second. It, that's how you get kids interested in reading. And they will take that reading habit and the story time, the wonderful memories, they'll have it for a lifetime. Sure. It's great. Right. And then they'll, you know, you, you probably, you probably read books to your daughter that were read to you as a kid, right? Exactly. I exactly. had, I gave my daughter my mother's Winnie the Pooh book. Oh, really? Right. So she read the same oh, book that, that my so mother cool. read. Exactly. So yes, story time. It's it, it, it a gift that keeps on giving, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And this is what we're talking about, the way libraries are changing and growing and being more reflective in their community. Let's go to Jackson County, Missouri. Emily Becker is the spokesperson there. And she says they've partnered with the health department in that county on a program called Connect Here. The Connect Here program essentially consists of a couple of kiosks inside two of our branches. Um, and there are specifically in branches and areas where the Jackson County Health Department felt there was the highest need for this type of service. 
So connect here. There's a kiosk with a survey that you fill out. Um, and it's a survey about, uh, you know, your basic needs, essentially housing, food, transportation, child care, things like that. And uh, you submit that survey through it goes to the Jackson County Health Department. And then within a couple of business days, you hear back from the health department and they can connect you to resources in the area to help you with some of those needs. So if you marked down um, that there were maybe some food security uh, concerns, they can connect you with local food banks. Um, you know, if you needed health care or mental health resources, they can connect you with resources in the area that can help you with that. Um, so it's really a great program. It's, um, you know, gives people an opportunity to get some um, uh, support from community resources that they might not be aware of. So you can hear how the whole concept of library is changing. Libraries are, you know, they're a safe space, they're a community space, they're we oftentimes refer to our branches as kind of a third space. It's not work. It's not home. Um, it's just a place that you can spend time. It's one of the only places that you can really go and just spend extended periods of time. You don't have to spend any money. Nobody expects anything of you. Um, and, you know, I think people really look to the public library because of that as a trusted space where they can find things that they need. You know, when you hear Emily speak, you realize... You kind of don't even need a library card, do you? Exactly, right. Of course, if you have one, that's great. And you can take out books. And if you don't bring it back, of course, there is a fine. There always has been. But, you know, even that has changed. Here's Emily again in Missouri. We also have a program that we run a couple times a year called Food for Fines, which is kind of part of our, you know, ways that we can help our, our broader community. So Food for Fines is... Uh, a program we host twice a year where folks can bring in non-perishable food items and place of money to pay off their fines. Um, so each item you bring in counts as a dollar um, and you can donate, you know, those non-perishable items to your local branch. And then after the program is over, our branches give those items to their local food pantries. So folks can still pay their fines at a rate of five cents a day. But the library, at least in Jackson County, Missouri, is willing to forgive the fines or make these alternate food arrangements whenever it's necessary. I certainly wish they had done that with me and my son. Uh oh. When he was a young kid in grammar school, one time, David, I didn't realize he had taken out a book and never returned it. And then one day in the mail, I get a bill for like $20. Well, did he read the book? <laughs> what, what do you think? <laughs> I'm sure he did. Oh, my no? God. What, so was, what was the I, book? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. Oh, I just bad. remember the bill. Oh, I'm sure. And so I called the library and she says, I'm sorry, but, you know, failure to return a book is like I had bought the book. Right. Well, needless to say, my son got more than a timeout for that little incident. I hope you put him in a corner, turned the chair around. Made him and read made, the book. Made him read the book. <laughs> Maybe just a couple of chapters. Well, I was pretty good about fines as a kid because, see, I was a reader and I always went to the library. So, you know, I think I went every week um, and the school library even more more frequently. Um, my problem was I would take out too many books. So I'd come home with a big stack. And, um, you know, if it was a new book, you had to return it in 14 days. There was a little window. And I didn't always get to finish all those books in 14 days. So a few fines. Oh, so let me guess. What, did you cut lawns or something to pay the library yeah, fines? Yeah, something like that. But, uh, hey, I found another great library story for us. Do you remember last season when you talked about that sensory trail in Hartford County, Maryland? Oh, yes. It was a park that was created just for special needs kids who needed more than just swings in the park. Right. Well, look, special needs kids, not only do they need the park, but they also need their library. And they need to use it differently. And that's when the folks in Durham County, North Carolina, they realized they needed to address special issues for the special needs kids there. I hope, don't tell me they put a drum in the library. No, 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 no. We're saving the drum <laughs> for the Hartford County, for the sensory trail, for the park outside. But we save that for the park. But you know those fidget toys that people right, play with? Right, Do you have, do you have, have a fidget I, toy? Uh, yeah, I love those things. All right, well, bubble wrap? Yes. Right, all that stuff. Okay, well, what they did was... In Durham County, they built a sensory room that has bubble walls. Oh, I love popping bubbles. Right, well, who doesn't? One room has, it's, well, it's basically a vibrating waterbed, so kids can, like, feel the music. What they wanted to do, what they wanted to do was create a safe space where kids would need just to decompress and have a place where they can go and relax and unwind. 
Can you check out a fidget toy? That's what I want to know. Well, I don't know if you can check out a fidget toy. They have them. <laughs> what they do have are these sensory kits, and they include things like those toys or squeeze balls, sunglasses, noise-canceling headphones. Oh, it's a great use of library space. Why it, not? It is. And it all started when someone walked into the library, and they approached the librarian. And this is kind of a funny story. She was working on her third day. And someone asked, you know, do the libraries have regular programs for kids with you know special needs? And the librarian said, uh, yeah, sure, we do. I mean, it was her third day. They would have told her she could or couldn't. So she said, yes, it sounds like a good idea. Why not? And you know, that's great she, that she took the initiative and ran with it. Uh, a government worker saying, yes, I can. And that's essentially how Durham County's Practicing Inclusivity Initiative got started. State and federal dollars helped get the program off the ground. They created those rooms. They created a program and they trained the staff. And now it's just part of the fabric of the library. All right, so now let's talk about something else that libraries are doing, and that is they're going virtual. And we'll have more about the virtual library after the break. First, a word from our sponsor, the National Association of Counties. The Good Government Show welcomes a new sponsor for season two, and that's NACO, and that's the National Association of Counties. Carol, did you know that county government affects more people than any other form of government? Well, I do now. Funny you would think city or the federal government is bigger. Well, right, but but it's not. You think about this. Roads, highways, hospitals, schools, recycling, law enforcement, water, sewers. In most of the country, those services are maintained by the county. That's county government. And we want to see good county government, and that's where NACO comes in. Exactly. They're a nationwide organization that represents all 3,069 counties across the USA. Now, that's a lot of support and, more importantly, brain power. Exactly. And they have many organizations and committees, and they do things like share best practices, and they work together on national issues. And they are urban, suburban, and rural counties that have different challenges, but they can still work together. Yes, they all work together. So NACO helps county government work better. And as we see in this and other episodes, when county government works, well, that's just good government. So thanks, NACO, for providing us with great stories and helping support good government. And thanks, NACO, for supporting the Good Government Show. And remember, citizens, don't forget to vote. Welcome back to the Good Government Show. I'm Dave Martin. David, I mentioned before, the libraries always have offered classes on various subjects. In fact, I even took a yoga class. It was kind of cool at my library. But like all of us- Did the, you take it with all the books surrounding you in the middle of the library? Uh, well, they had a special library, a special, a special room, room for okay. that. All yeah, right, so right. I, we didn't bump into the books. Good. Did you get a live book on the way in or out? <laughs> no. All right. all right. Anyway, so you'll get, the, you'll get the library. Right, right. And uh, But like all of us, the library has to learn to do things virtually, you know, ever since COVID. And a library in Fairfax County, Virginia held would you believe, a virtual boot camp recently. Deb Smith-Cohen knows all about that. So we came up with the idea for the small business boot camp and submitted our proposal at the beginning of March 2020. Two weeks later, of course, the library closed. So we had submitted our proposal for a boot camp uh, to be held um, either in the fall or in the spring. And... Um, and we were all becoming experts on Zoom, and we also had, were following the news that indicated that as people were leaving other jobs, they were looking at pursuing their entrepreneurial interests and that there really was a market for this program to go forward, but that it would need to be virtual. We put together a list of presenters to present some basic uh, presentations uh, that covered handling money, building your business plan, finding local industry-specific uh, information to understand your market, your competitors, and getting the financial data that would support uh, requests for funding. Or we also had a speaker on marketing skills, on um, hiring and managing uh, employees, um, on launching and an effective launch strategy, um, and a small mention on uh, social media presence. We held all of the eight courses on Zoom, across four weeks, meeting twice a week in the evening. So 40 people registered for that virtual class. 25 people actually completed the class, which is not a bad ratio. One of them was a young woman named Emma Bet Tedesi. She always wanted to start her own business. So she was just a perfect candidate for this course. She wanted to start a company to teach ethnic food cooking, but made simple. And she says the boot camp really opened her eyes. And of course, with the library, absolutely free. 
I've always known there were resources out there, but not to the level of this depth. But this class also expanded on the level of resources that were out there. It's a wealth of knowledge that I think I've only topped a quarter of it, but there's databases that I learned about that were free. I canceled some of my subscriptions to magazines and uh, like LinkedIn, sorry to say it, but because they had it. There was a lot of resources available to me for free that were like a godsend. You know, and here's something else she said about libraries that I never really considered. She said she can trust the library information more than other sources. You could Google stuff. Like I, I Googled and YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all the social media stuff out there. But there's always like, well, do they really know what they're talking about? Is this valid? Is it not valid? That is always so it helps alleviate a lot of that. David, you know what else is changing? the infrastructure of buildings. Here's Emily Becker of Jackson County, Missouri, and she gave a good description of that. Listen to this. Well, do they have showers there? I mean, that would be a good use. <laughs> no showers at this No one. showers at this one. Okay, let's hear Emily. Our library director used to joke um, that our older buildings, you know, they were built with like one plug on each wall, <laughs> and that was for the vacuum cleaner to come in and, and clean up the library at the end of the day. But Today, people come in, they want to be able to plug in their devices, they want to use the Wi-Fi, they want to reserve one of our private meeting rooms so that they can have a, you know, a small business meeting or a tutoring session or just a quiet place to work. Um, you know, so there's people use the library in different ways today than they have before. And so we've, you know, adjusted our services and resources to keep up with those needs. Before we go, you have to talk about the old bookmobile. You did a story about bookmobiles last season. Yes, the Chattawaba County Mobile Library. This is something other libraries are doing now. Right. And one of the places is in Scott County, Minnesota. That's a Minneapolis St. Paul suburb. They're using their bookmobile to improve preschool literacy. Other bookmobiles allow disconnected citizens a strong internet connection. And that was part of the Chattawaba mission, too. They helped with online forms and applications. Some of those applications, it's like you have to be a Philadelphia lawyer <laughs> and you need help. <laughs> right. And one of the other areas where libraries are making a difference is in workspace. You know, one of the current trends, more people are working from home, but libraries are creating a space to work from home, but actually you're working at the library. Well, that makes sense because not everyone can work from home. Sometimes there are just too many distractions and sometimes you don't have a good internet connection. Right. So what libraries are doing is they're creating a workspace and meeting spaces. And showers. Back to the showers. I love the libraries that have showers. It really changes it from a library with books to a real community center that can provide so many services for so many people. And we're going to talk more about those after the break. The Good Government Show is sponsored by Liquid. Welcome back to Season 2 Liquid. And we still love Liquid. And not just because they are a sponsor again. But Carol, here's a fun fact. A recent study found that over 80% of retail shoppers conduct online research before making a purchase. Do you do that? Well, yeah, you know, I do it when I know what I'm buying. Like, for instance, we needed some bug spray for the backyard. We were having a party. But we have dogs, so I didn't want anything toxic for the dogs. So I had to run down a lot of products online. So you did, you did your research. I did. All right, good. And if you're in a business, you really have to do your research because you really want to evaluate who you're working with and making sure the company you are about to partner with, you want to make sure it's a good fit. Well, that makes sense. So you want to stand out to other companies that are checking your company out. Exactly. And that's where Liquid comes in. They can help your business create a digital presence with impact so you can be impressive to new businesses and keep your customers. And it's not just about a website. See how much I've learned about liquid since the first season? You're, you are you are liquid aware. Good for you. Right. <laughs> so they can guide you where to advertise, make sure your social media is relevant, and it engages your customers. Uh, they want to make sure your digital story answers your potential customers' questions before they even have to ask them. And that's what Liquid is good at, creating a full marketing and online digital presence. Liquid's been around for nearly two decades. They have a lot of experience and a lot of research to back up their plans. And they have a team of designers, marketers, strategists, and developers. They can help companies in many industries with award-winning creative campaigns, content, and websites. All good reasons to have Liquid plan your next digital marketing strategy. So check them out and talk to a Liquid professional. Visit them at www.liquidint.com. That's www 
liquidint.com. And you will love Liquid as much as we do. Because they're our sponsor. We love Liquid. We want to welcome back as a sponsor to the Good Government Show, Kutztown University of Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And you want to talk about their rugby team. Well, they do have a good rugby team. They just won a national tournament. And what I did was I called a friend. His daughter played at Kutztown. She played on the rugby team. And I asked him, what did he like best about Kutztown? You mean besides the rugby team? Well, yeah, besides the team, obviously the team first. But he responded to me and said something I didn't know. His favorite thing is the chicken tower, or it's also called the angry chicken. What? I hesitate to ask. The angry chicken? Well, it's such a landmark that it's actually the school's logo. It's a clock tower. And apparently when you look from a special angle, um, the clock looks a little bit like a chicken with an open beak. So okay. it's the angry chicken. Okay, then. Well, let's talk about the other stuff, like that their degree program in music business is now nationally accredited. They offer undergraduate certificates in cybersecurity and technical writing. So is this what we do? Is this technical oh, writing? Oh, no, 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 no. Take a class and maybe get better at writing. Oh, come on. That's not fair. You know what? You would benefit from the new graduate certificate program and be a school social worker. Maybe you'd be nicer. <laughs> All right. Well, the point is Kutztown is a forward-looking university. They also offer Pell Promise scholarships. And for students who qualify, student tuitions and fees are all covered. And that's just some of why we like Kutztown and are happy to be associated with this university. Oh, and my friend thought it was really cool that sometimes the locals, they ride through in a horse and buggy. So check out Kutztown University. That's Kutztown University and cheer on the rugby team. Of course. Yes, please. So as we've talked about, libraries are doing really incredible things. And to the user, it's all free. So how does the government help here? Well, many of the libraries do receive state funding. And then some of them have what they call Friends of the Library Foundation that it provides money. And many of the things that we heard about today, the libraries are partnering with other county departments. For instance, Jackson County, Missouri. The health department provided services to the library, and the kiosks that we heard about came from the health department. So there was no uh, nothing extra that they had to buy. In Fairfax, Virginia, when they did the boot camp, well, the first year the speakers bureau was all volunteer. The second year the speakers were getting paid. They also apply for grants. So there's a variety of funding sources, but without a doubt, the libraries can function without their county and the state governments. So it's the local library, the county, the state, and other municipalities all working together to fund something that absolutely. every community needs. Yes, absolutely. So I got to talk with Michelle Capazella. She's the director of the Mayapac Library. A friend of mine actually volunteers at the Mayapac Library. That's how I met Michelle. And Mayapac is outside of New York City. And at this small town library, they offer different services and they provide space for groups, among other things. And I asked her what people say about what the library offers. People just thank us, you know, thank us for being here. You know, thank us for providing, again, providing a space. They love our programs. They love to come to the program. She also brought up another reason why people love their library, or at least one thing parents appreciate. We have a, a gaming um, a gaming a club for teens, you know, and they come here. And it's just kind of a place, a safe place to hang out for, you know, again, all ages. Like the kids, the teens come here. Their parents know it's a safe place to, to come and hang out. Well, that's really important. You know, as a working mom, it... it it's hard to try and do your work and always look over your kid's shoulder to see what they're doing on the computer. Right. If they're getting into trouble. Yes, you're right, Carol. That's important. But there's something else here. And this is something Michelle said. She said, going to the library is one of the few places where anyone can go and just sit for as long as they want, no charge. They don't have to buy coffee. They don't have to buy lunch. They don't have to buy anything. They can just sit. They can read. They can write. They can compute. All of it for free as long as they want. Isn't that amazing? You know, you're so right about this. I didn't think of that. I mean, you see people hanging out at coffee places, but everyone has bought coffee or something. And that's what you have to do to sit there. And it gets better because at the library, guess what? You can actually bring your own snacks. You know, wow. Isn't that amazing? At one time, you could never bring food into a library. Well, there are rules. You know, you you have to be clean, not messy. But many libraries have put in coffee bars so you can have coffee, you can have a snack. And before you go, I want to give a librarian the last word on libraries today. When it comes down to it, libraries are very versatile. And we've changed over the years so much. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, because people say we don't need libraries anymore because we don't read, you know, people don't read, people don't. It's, you know, it's so much more than that. And I think if people who have that attitude would come to a library, they would be super surprised at what we have. Basically, I think if you're not using the library, I think you're missing out. I think libraries have a lot more things than 
do you think? I would say go to your library and see all the stuff that they offer and you would be, you'd be surprised. There's something there you're going to be interested in. Can I confess? I really want to take a shower in a library. What is with you in showers <laughs> in the library? What is? With- I, I'm just so fascinated. It's so different. Well, Good. Then I guess we'll have to fly you down to Texas so you can take a shower. I'm just amazed at how versatile libraries are. The coffee bars, the speakers, English language classes, and the free legal advice is great. All part of the modernization of libraries. It really is an excellent use of government dollars. I know that I gave a library in the last word already, but I want to read something. And I found this on the on the website for the Mayapak Library. This is the section where they talk about not having overdue funds, and and this bears listening to. We believe our community is stronger, healthier, and engages in more robust and civil discourse when residents have access to the information they need to pursue their educational, career, family, and life goals. We believe late fees and overdue fines act as a barrier to the free flow of information, thereby reducing civic engagement. And they are an inspiring way to look at libraries. It really is. I mean, right there, they're saying, come to the library. Everyone come to the library. We're going to be a better community. We're going to be better citizens for it. And as we've heard, they're right. They're right. It brings people together. I'm Carol DiOria. This is The Good Government Show. We'll see you next time when we will tell you another story about government working. And I'm Dave Martin. Thanks for listening to The Good Government Show. Check out our website and meet some of the people and places in our stories. See you next time. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please tell your friends to listen too. Follow us and like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and be part of the conversation. And please give us a five-star rating right here where you're listening to this podcast. Your support helps us continue to tell stories of good government in action. For extras on all of our shows, visit our website, goodgovernmentshow.com. The Good Government Show is produced by Valley Park Productions. Jim Ludlow, David Martin, and David Snyder are the executive producers. Jason Stershik is our editor and producer. Some transcriptions were done by Kofi Ajin Ampa. Our hosts are me, David Martin, and Carol Dioria. Join us again for The Good Government Show wherever you listen to your podcasts.